who are the women on screen who you thought were maybe sort of role models for you when you were growing up? We'll start with you, Vicky. To be honest, I, you know, if I'm being dead honest, I didn't have anybody that sort of struck a chord with me. I, I, I was watching films when I was younger, like with the likes of Julia Robertson, you know, but I wasn't sort of attracted to her as a role model. But now looking back at the films that I'd watched, things like Educating Rita with, you know, Julie Walters and watching her career and, you know, she is a massive inspiration to me. And I do see her as quite a kick-ass woman, you know, she's got that real vibe around her and she's real and she's extremely talented. Lizzie? Okay, so it's slightly scary, but at the age of three, my third birthday, I went to see Sounds of Music. And then as an adult watching it, I realised that probably watching what we're going to do the problem about Maria, the idea of a problematic woman, okay, she was a nanny and then a wife, but she was kind of quite an individualistic person. I think, oh, I think that must have permeated my three-year-old self. Uh, probably as a teenager, the seminal influence is kind of a bit obvious, but it was my brilliant career and watching a girl with unruly hair and a bit scruffy, but who had an ambition to be a writer was, okay, that, that's, that's pretty cool. And how about you, Elizabeth? Well, it's, uh, one of my first book reports I did at school was on Little House on the Prairie. Yeah. And on the cover, you know how when you were a kid, you drew with crayons. I was brought up in the States. And I remember drawing Laura on her pony galloping across the prairie. And that, to me, represented, you know, going to a place of the unknown, carving out a future, being a pioneer woman, going fast, riding bareback. And interesting, like Lizzie sang Sound of Music. For me, I remember I must have, I think I was probably about eight years old, and there was a movie theater that we could drive to up the road, and for a quarter, you could go and see a movie on a Sunday afternoon. And I went to see National Velvet. Mm -hmm. And I realized, I'm glad you asked this question, because I thought, well, what did really first hit me when I was tiny? And it was National Velvet. And I, I haven't seen it for a million years, but I looked up on Wikipedia. And of course, you know, Elizabeth Taylor plays um, Velvet, or is it Violet Brown? And she rides Pi in the Grand National. And it's only when she falls off and she doesn't cross the finishing line, they realize that it's a girl. It's not a boy jockey. And I thought, well, of course. It made sense. She broke all the rules. She did what she wasn't supposed to do, but she had determination. She had ambition. And then I think kind of going on from that up until about the age of 13. My mother worked in the school system and in the States as a psychiatric social worker in very politicized times with Martin Luther King and Kennedy. And um, she would always come home and watch the late, late, late afternoon movie on CBS. And that was the first time I saw Douglas Sirk's film, Imitation of Life, with Lana Turner and Juanita Moore. And because it's about two women coming together and trying to help each other through very difficult times and issues of miscegenation, race, passing as white, which, you know, I went to a local state school and we were bust at that time um, when desegregation came in. And that really, really affected me, that film. And to this day, it's a very important film for me. Okay, we wanted to focus just at first on the sort of 30s, 40s, 50s, when there seemed to be a lot of really, really strong women in cinema. Obviously, the femme fatale was a, was a, a, a key trope of that period, in a way where their sexuality is to the fore and a, and a strength. I mean, obviously, also a, a threat, but yeah. it, it's, a, it's a weapon. And you could argue there was an ambiguity about it because it was also, you know, it was a spider woman, but also uh, the, the, the power inherent in a duplicitous female that was sort of the running, running sort of story of those films. But it was someone who was empowered in, in, in every way. And it, it was, you, you had the you know, representations of motherhood, you had, you know, but you had, but you had complex ones, Mildred Pierce being the obvious one that's been revisited recently. The interesting thing for me is that there was a, a strong female audience going and the studios who were making these films were conscious of courting that audience. And, that, and they were courting that audience with a very sim simple idea, well, women want to go and see films in which women are playing central roles. MGM famously, you know, called, they, they knew that was their core constituency, so they wanted to make women's pictures, and, and they range from the more, more obviously melodramatic to, to more, more complex. Um, they also, the power of the female star was manifest, and obviously Rita Hayworth and, and Marlene Dietrich were, were seminal, and that, and, but they, they knew that, 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 that they had to create roles for those, those, those actors. Um, Whereas I feel now the power of the female star is on, on it's, it's not as manifest as it used to be. Well, there were many more female scriptwriters hired by the studios and also often uncredited. You know, they had a mm. whole workroom, much like in the TV structure today, where you'd have a writer's room. They had, you know, and Lillian Hellman was out there, loads of people were out there just 
typing away. And well, it was yeah, it was again back to looking at MGM specifically, but other studios also brought in women writers. But MGM, you know, Thalberg wanted to court the female audience. So I thought, okay, then I need to court the female audience. I need to bring women writers onto the team. At that time. Women weren't represented in public office. They weren't represented in politics. They weren't represented in cultural forums. They, they just didn't hold positions of power. Um, they basically existed in the home as, you know, the mother. There was that dichotomy much more strongly felt of yeah. kind of the version of the horse. So it was the problem stories of Mildred Pierce or the problem story of a Gilda or of a Frenchie. So in a sense, there was a kind of mystique. And the only place that women could see these stories in some ways exactly. was in the fantasy world of the movies. I think that's a, that's a really important mm -hmm. point. And I think, again, you can sort of see the rise in the 70s of the queer woman pick. Um, and the, obviously, it had a history in, in the sort of particularly around Hepburn, was probably the, the you know, kind of trope. And these, we are getting, I mean, obviously a lot of American television, particularly with sort of Buffy and Dollhouse, I don't know if people saw Dollhouse and Serenity. What, why is it, would you say, that those female roles, why are there more of them in TV than there are in film? I think that there was, again, sort of, this is an obvious point, but there was a big you know, shift when TV became dominant in sort of popular culture in the 60s, if you think about it, you know, and there was an understanding that the way that the there was a, again the female audience moved from film to television in terms of a perception of the demo, demographics. If TV became the space that that um, more female-driven stories were perceived to have their you know have have their their their, their, their domain, um, and actually that's had good and negative effects because actually you do get far more interesting female roles in television, but it just means, I think, still to the deficit of, of, of film, which now the core demographic is, as we are constantly told, is, you know, young men between the ages of 15 and 25. And I don't necessarily believe that's completely true, but that's the, that's the, the perception and that's what's constantly, you know, peddled to, to, to everyone that, you know, that is the, the demographic you have to court. I think the problem in, in film now, as we see the, the finance model kind of collapse in independent films through various things, you know, one of them piracy amongst many, many other reasons. And, um, you know, it's an expensive business. It's not just expensive to make films, which you can make cheaply, but to try and launch them and to get them out there and the spend that you have to do for prints and advertising and to sell European movies to the States now is really, really tough. I mean, and if you, this is all business, but if you look at a finance plan or model, 20 years ago, you would have had 30 or 40% of the budget price of your film as a price against America, what you could sell it for. These days, typically, it's zero. Um, and, you know, it costs a lot of money to try and get bums on seats, and people probably take fewer risks. And as Lizzie said, because the audience is defined as being male, 16 to 24, 15 to 25, those risks aren't really being taken. And perhaps the risk that's perceived is, you know, that the, the stars are predominantly male, the, the ones that still have a marquee value, because mm -hmm. increasingly actors don't have the same kind of marquee value that was associated with films of the past. And also their age range is lower. So yeah. you, in terms of, yeah. you know, the again, sort of back to a woman driving a film, you know, you, you, you don't have the f same level of female star system. So let's move on to the early 90s, when women were really suddenly becoming action heroes. So having roles that men traditionally would have had in big Hollywood films. Because it's a sort of, to me, it's the post-Ripley and actually also Sarah Connor effect. So you had That's Alien right. and then you had Terminator, huge, two huge franchises. Obviously Alien, mm. more effective. But if you, you know, it's interesting watching the Terminator again on, on recently... That was a kind of seminal in terms of, of the kind of the visceral mother, the kind of, you know, she, okay, she's a mother to be in Terminator, but there's a sense of this protectivity. Obviously, Alien Ripley's synonymous with that. And I think the fact they did well was helped generate these yeah. stories. I mean, we had Kick Ass, as obviously that's the title of, of, of this, of this uh, discussion. It came out last year, which I thoroughly enjoyed as, as exactly seeing the sort of kick ass girl. But, but it, if it had done, I mean, it did, it did well in the box office, but if it had done phenomenal box office, one wonders as if it would have kick-started kick yeah. another generation of, of stories in which women were holding the picture and 
very active action heroines. And I think ultimately the tragedy is it just comes down to what 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 glues. Yeah, that's yeah, what I, goes I, well at the box office. Yeah. yeah, I mean you're talking about a business and I think as he's saying they're franchise movies and you know, when you're in any form, I hate to use the word, but like a capitalist model, but a sort of money-making model is you have to continue to exploit new pockets. You know, you see that on a global level. You continually have to think, okay, let's, let's do something else, but not change too much. So it's hard to sort of say that these are roles. I mean, it's great. I remember when, um, I worked for a company called Palace and it was a distribution company. We bought Nikita for distribution. I remember seeing it for the first time. We were like completely blown away. I thought it was fantastic. But it did have its place in earlier, I mean, uh, John Cassavetti's film, Gilda, and films like that. But that's an example where independent films probably fed studio films. So you see that happening all the time. But I think the important thing to remember is that they were hugely successful financial models and so will be repeated and repeated until that formula runs dry. And then you know, it, what was so incredible about Thelma and Louise is they took the Western and sort of completely reinvented it in what I think was a very um, cultural and politically important way. Mm. But um, then you, and you had the power of Ridley Scott behind it, making well, yeah. it. I mean, mm -hmm. it's Kelly Curry True. writing yeah. it, but it was Ridley Scott who sort of put it into a particular space at that time. I mean, they were for a film that essentially had been, there'd been lots of men had played two outlaws in a mm. film. Yeah, yeah. But it was a switch. Yeah. It was a switcheroo, which yeah. is again the sort of, you know, often, you know, I read screenplays and I'll go, wouldn't that be more interesting if it was two women in in those roles rather than two guys? I mean, I, I mean, we're we're you know we're in a place now where we're making decisions about filmmaking and what gets funded. I kind of think we're, we're, we're so open to screenplays that are kind of, you know, we're looking for those stories, but we also go, where are they? Well, we don't see them being generated. Yeah. We see some, some very good <laughs> ones, but they're in, the, they're in the minority rather than the majority. Particularly, I suppose I've been thinking about a lot about women writing comedy recently, and it's kind of, you know, really, really thin on the ground at the moment. Well, I think it's just, and it comes down to simple statistics. I mean, there just aren't enough women screenwriters. Women, female yeah. screenwriters. They say, writer, write about what you know. And there just aren't enough out there. So, um... Well, it's, and women directors even worse situation. Yeah. I mean, at least with women writers, it's, there's a soft sort of, sort of pool. But actually, what depresses me, I was writing my book 20 years ago and it got published in 94 and someone said to me, you know, could you update it? And I said, well, actually, the depressing thing is the post, you know, the po postscript would be quite a short chapter mm. because not much has significantly changed. That is depressing. That is depressing. Yeah. Well, on that note, hopefully there are female screenwriters in the audience. But I think, yeah. back to this country, I think what we should feel very optimistic in terms of, you know, here we have, you know, a great actor, we have a great producer, and also synonymous with incredibly good films that, and, and projects around women. And I think in the UK, we ha we're kind of in the film scenario, we're in a much healthier situation than in the heart of Hollywood. Yeah. Um, and yeah. actually, again, it's more likely that something, back to the, you know, the trickle down effect, the trickle up, if there was an independent yeah. smash movie here. Mm. Yeah. And again, I think, then again, an you know, back to what I was saying earlier about the Danes, you know, we have produced a generation of actors who've, who in their later years, Helen Mirren, um, Judy Dench. Judy Dench. Yeah, Maggie all, Smith. Yeah, Maggie Smith, who have, you know, who are on kind of cast lists for films, you know, that can help get films made. Yeah. yeah. And that's really so that's, important to remember. That's a much more optimistic yeah. note to end yeah. on. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so please join me in thanking Vicky, Lizzie, and Elizabeth.